All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA mock exam six edition series where we are going through individual questions based on specific task list items and sections. As always, if you have a suggestion, a recommendation, or something you want us to work on specifically, please comment below. We're going through those as we create new mini mocks. You can also put individual items. So if you're struggling with G2, for example, and G3, put those and we can start making more specific items. Once we finish up our six edition task list series, which is in progress, and we only got a few more sections to go there, we're going to start do, doing too many mocks a week. And so we'll be able to branch out a lot more on those. As always, to get all of those videos, make sure you subscribe, like, and share. We love word of mouth. We love when you come and tell us you passed your exam or your friend passed your exam or you're spreading this around, we just love providing great ABA content for all of you. With that said, let's get to our mini mock, mock, work hard, study hard. Let's get going. You're helping a local community garden determine why volunteers are dropping out. You provide the volunteers with a survey asking them to rank various tasks, weeding, planting, composting, from most liked to least liked. You then observe which volunteers actually show up on weeding day versus planting day. Why is the second step, the observation, necessary to evaluate the assessment? Now in this mini mock, what we're going to do is use a bunch of real world examples. Because as a BCBA, even though you're often working one-on-one -on -one in these clinical controlled environments, ABA is human behavior at the end of the, end of the day. So you've got to understand how are science and principles apply to everyday life. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's break this question down. You're going through a local community garden to determine why volunteers are dropping out. Okay, your goal is to figure out why are volunteers leaving. You give them a survey. So when you read these questions, okay, survey, that's an indirect assessment. You ask them to rank various tasks from most liked to least liked. So you've basically done an indirect preference assessment. You then observe volunteers, which is a direct assessment, showing up on this weeding day versus planting day. Why is the observation necessary to evaluate your assessment? A, because surveys are a form of descriptive assessment and are accurate. Surveys are indirect. Can they be accurate? Is there some accuracy? Most likely, but they aren't good enough to really draw conclusions because you're not observing anything. You're just asking people questions and bias comes into play. Emotions come into play when you just ask questions questions. So a survey is just not enough. B, to evaluate the predictive validity of the preference assessment against actual engagement. What does that mean? It's basically saying, is the preference assessment actually predicting engagement? If we just have the preference assessment data, we aren't going to know if it actually has any bearing on engagement. So we've got to have to actually watch who shows up when and then evaluate it against that preference assessment data to give the preference assessment data more credibility. C, conduct a functional analysis of why volunteers dislike weeding. Now it's jumping way ahead. You've got weeding day, you've got planting day. Their volu their volunteers are dropping out all over the place. C is, is using something or, or taking a step further without enough data and information. D, determine if the volunteers have the physical skill strengths to weed properly. Well, that's not really necessary for what we're trying to do. Now, if it comes down to it and we do our assessment, we do our observation, and we realize the weeding is hated because of physical strength, then we can get there. But again, still not enough data. So just given the information, we want to figure out, is the preference assessment at all related to actual engagement? A high school coach wants to know why a star player is suddenly missing practice. He watches the player from the bleachers for a week. He sees that every time the player's phone buzzes, the player looks distressed and walks toward the locker room. The coach notes the buzz, the walking away, and the player being alone in the locker room. The coach concludes the function is escape. What is the main limitation of the coach's assessment? Now, the coach is doing the right thing here. Okay, He's, he's trying to figure out why the behavior is occurring. His star player is missing practice. He's doing observation, which is great. He sees this kind of ABC pattern, right? Phone buzzes, player walks away, 
players alone. Coach just assumes, well, he must be trying to escape something. Now, what is the limitation of that assessment? A, it is indirect assessment and therefore unreliable. Well, he's directly observing his player, so it's, it's not indirect, right? It's direct. B, coach did not use a standardized skill-based assessment tool. The coach isn't looking at skills. He's looking at his behavior, which he doesn't know why it's happening. He doesn't know the function. C, it's a descriptive assessment and can only show correlation, not functional relation. Yes, the problem with just direct observation is we can correlate things. Coach can correlate this buzzing to walking away and draw conclusions, but it doesn't actually show a functional relationship. We would actually have to do much more of a functional analysis to start to get any sort of functional relationship. So it's a good start. It's just not strong enough, and there are limitations to just observing without further information. D, the coach should have used a preference assessment for the phone first. That doesn't seem necessary given he sees the player with the phone all the time, and it isn't necessary to figure out why he's missing practice in this context. Limitation is it's a descriptive assessment, can only show correlation, not an actual functional relation. A corporate consultant is brought in to reduce office gossip. The consultant sets up four different break rooms for one hour. In room A, gossip is ignored. Room B, consultant joins in. Room C, consultant provides work-related praise. Room D, consultant tells them get back to work. By measuring the rate of gossip at each specific condition, the consultant is doing what? This is probably the easiest question so far, because if you don't overthink it, just picture what this looks like, right? We're looking at a behavior, office gossip. The consultant needs to know why it's happening. Room A, he's ignoring the gossip. Attention. Room B, consultant joins in. Maybe more attention. Room C, consultant provides praise. So maybe more attention or social reinforcement. Room D, the consultant tells them to get back to work. Maybe it's an escape thing. We don't know what each function is in A, B, C, or D, but what it does look like is he's trying to determine why the behavior is occurring and what that maintaining consequence is. And when we're manipulating consequences and antecedents to determine the function, what are we doing? Well, we're implementing a functional analysis, and it appears that's what's happening here. I'll read all of your answer choices. B, designing a descriptive assessment. He's not designing a descriptive assessment. He's actually implementing what is something that is, is very close to a functional analysis. C, interpreting data to determine the need for referral. He's already a consultant. He's not trying to refer out to anybody as far as we know based on this information. D, integrating cultural variables into the office environment. There's no talk about culture here. He's simply running these simple little quick FAs in each room and trying to figure out why is this behavior happening? What consequence may be maintaining the gossip? So what is he doing? He's implementing a functional analysis. A city's public works department is trying to reduce loitering in a downtown plaza. They install high frequency noisemakers that only young people can hear. After two weeks, data shows show that young people have left the plaza, but elderly residents who previously sat on the benches for hours have also stopped coming because they find the presence of the devices unwelcoming, even if they can't hear them. When evaluating this intervention's impact, what should the behavior analyst conclude? All right, I like this question. I think it's a, a difficult question, but it, it makes you think, right? It really makes us think about all the keys to our interventions and what we're trying to accomplish. This department wants to reduce loitering, and they want loitering of, it appears, young people to stop. Now, it does seem successful. Young people are leaving the plaza, but now elderly residents aren't coming either. So nobody's coming to this plaza. So they've made it worse for young people and old people. Now, when they evaluate the impact, what can they conclude? A, the assessment of social significance was flawed because it failed to account for the collateral effects on non-target stakeholders. Let's break that down. Social significance, right? What is the effect? What is the meaningful effect? What is the, the real life effect on, um, from the intervention, right? In this case, not only are young kids not coming, but old residents, elderly residents as well. So it did fail to account for those effects on these non-target stakeholders. The young people, right, are 
the people were focused on, not the elderly, but were affecting the elderly in a pretty meaningful way as well, because they're, now they're not coming to the plaza they used to come to. B, descriptive assessment was successful because the target behavior decreased. Remember, we're not just black and white where, well, we decreased or we increased, everything worked out great. A lot more goes into that, right? We've got to see the big picture and what we're actually doing when that behavior changes. A preference assessment should have been conducted with noisemakers first to see if elderly like them. Well, maybe, right? But how are they supposed to know if the devices are unwelcoming or if they can't hear them? Or how do you even conduct that preference assessment? The overall significance from, from the beginning wasn't assessed properly and was flawed because it never accounted for what it might do to the other patrons. D, the noise acts as a medical variable and requires a referral to an audiologist for all residents. Yes, we always account for medical first. There's no signs this is a medical issue. The problem was the social significance wasn't thoroughly analyzed before implementation. You're observing a professional kitchen where the head chef is trying to decrease cross-contamination errors. You notice that errors spike specifically between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. The dinner rush, you also notice that the kitchen's layout requires chefs to walk 20 feet to the only hand-washing sink. Before recommending a behavioral coaching package for the staff, what is the most critical interpretation of this data? How would you interpret this assessment data? You have a kitchen. You don't want cross-contamination. You see, okay, some sort of scatter plot data maybe where errors are spiking during the dinner rush okay you notice the kitchen layout requires a long walk to the hand washing sink so if you're in this dinner rush this this, this busy busy time 20 feet back and forth every time to wash your hands is a lot now how would you assess that data hey chefs lack the skill strength of proper hygiene and need remedial training it doesn't appear that the chefs can't wash their hands but maybe the effort is a lot be a functional analysis should be conducted by closing to the, the kitchen to test the chef's response to attention versus escape. It's not really a function issue either, based on this information. C, the assessment identifies an environmental structural constraint that makes the desired behavior high effort during high demand periods. Sure, walking that 20 feet back and forth during a very, very busy, busy dinner, dinner rush might just be too much for this chef. So that's a very important environmental variable that may need to be adjusted. D, data suggests that the chefs have a low preference for hand washing. Data don't show that. Data show that during this specific time, hand washing goes down. So based on our data, we have an environmental constraint that makes it high effort during high demand. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for all of our updates. Check out our six edition task list series. Comment below what you'd like to see next, work hard, study hard, and see you soon.